All right, so um, basically you learned most that we need to learn about stuff in uh, VinSim and Insight Maker now. And so now we've transitioning away from learning about the tools to just seeing more sophisticated examples of how the tools can be used. And so this chapter from Warcraft is kind of our first example of that. So we got three more chapters, this chapter and two more to go in uh, Warcraft. And then we'll talk about a couple of um, advanced things like chaos and tipping points and so on. Uh, but um, and then that's pretty much it. So um, then it's just kind of uh, your final projects and the final exam. So it's kind of all downhill from here. So um, in this chapter, um, I like to pick this chapter because it kind of shows the value of abstraction and what we call coarse graining. Because if we talk about modeling the entire oil industry, um, in reality, that's thousands of firms, billions of customers. And so um, you might think that in order to really capture all of the features of those things, you might need like a really gigantic model um, modeling, you know, about everything. But um, it's probably, um, you probably can capture most of the salient features of this thing by kind of averaging out some of these firms, especially the really little ones that are just in a, you know, in a competing for, uh, you know, to sell their oil on the market and don't really have much control over the price. They probably all behave roughly the same to the point where you just kind of bundle them together into one category. So that was kind of the thought here is that you can take the appropriate perspective and simplify models of even the most complex things. We started out when we talked about Forrester and this world dynamics model, it had like five stocks in it. And it supposedly explained like, you know, all of the future of the human society on the whole planet with like five stocks. And so it's kind of a similar idea. Of course, you can get overly simplified, but and then the point is you don't have to be like super fine grained. So, you know, on that scale from realism to metaphor, um, there's a spot in the middle where it makes the modeling easy, but you still get a lot of uh, interesting uh, perspective or interesting insights out. So that's kind of what they did um, in here is that the perspective they took was instead of modeling individual firms, you model large groups of firms. Um, but why would you bother to go through this modeling process to begin with? And so this is actually motivated by a real uh, case that Moorcroft uh, worked on with uh, Royal Dutch Shell at that time, Shell Oil. Um, and so the Shell team wanted to develop modeling tools to help them discover new concepts and just generally become more agile and recognizing things that could happen in the future. So it was not an exercise in predicting what will happen in the future. It was exercises sort of saying that um, if we have the dynamics of these things right, then what are all of the kind of possible things that we might have to deal with? And if we, if we understand possible futures, then we can sort of start preparing for them, even if we don't know which future will actually happen. So it gives some perspectives into sort of thinking forward about a problem. So it's not for predicting the future, it's sort of giving an idea about alternative futures to develop what if thinking was kind of the, the point here. So, um, and this is kind of motivated by looking at ugly time series of real data like these. And so, um, this is, uh, you know, looking at, this is price of oil. Um, these are real data going back from 1869 to when oil really became kind of a bigger thing um, all the way through 2010. And, um, and if you look at this, there are, uh, in these kind of behavior over time plots, there are critical events that occur that give us some idea of what what uh, factors might be driving these changes, but we don't really understand the underlying dynamic. So the beginning of the industry, um, there's kind of a lot of variability um, in the price, which has to do with variability in the availability of oil that's available. And then suddenly Rockefeller takes over and being a business person realizes that this variability in price is a major cost. And so when you're doing business, you need to be able to plan. And so Rockefeller realizes that if they can kind of take over the oil industry, um, then they can have sort of more direct control over the price of oil. And Rockefeller does pretty well at that. 
Um, but then uh, the so-called Seven Sisters, um, you know, it's kind of a group of um, the, the oil industry that learned from Rockefeller and learned how to kind of do it even better. And then they have kind of even more stable control of the price. And then um, uh, OPEC seizes control. So uh, the uh, um, uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, um, ends up seizing control of a major source of oil. And they're not driven by business uh, pressures so much as socioeconomic, uh, you know, political, geopolitical pressures. And so that means that they can actually use price in order to sort of put forward some of their political agenda on the rest of the world. And something that's been controlled very tightly is now allowed to vary again. And so, um, and even within OPEC control, um, and uh, after these initial price hikes, um, they came back down, they sort of settled down. And during this period of time, uh, people thought that, well, maybe we're done with uh, volatility. And, um, and so they kind of predicted that just based on historical data that things will kind of be flat from here on out. Uh, but then, of course, they weren't. So, um, you know, then uh, the volatility went up. And, you know, so we watch oil very, you know, carefully now. I um, mean, it does have a lot of interesting volatility and it reflects a lot of interesting things going on all over the world. It's not like just the price of orange juice. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a much more complicated thing. So that was the idea is like, can we try to understand the underlying dynamic that explain the different time scale features here from the small scale kind of oscillations? Like you notice when uh, Rockefeller has it, there's like these sort of small scale oscillations. But then when OPEC has control, there's kind of these larger oscillations, maybe with a different period here. And then there's just longer dynamics too. Can we explain why you can be sort of flat for so long and then suddenly have one of these explosions here. Um, is there something about these patterns that can just emerge endogenously from the system? So um, how can we kind of understand that? So that's what, um, you know, I mean, Shell was realizing that you can look at these time series data and history, you can take some guesses, but they really wanted to say, can we get a system dynamics model to give us a better idea of what might happen in the future rather than just assuming it's gonna be like the immediate past. So that's kind of the motivation here. All right, so um, any questions about the kind of history and the context here? Why we might want a, a system dynamics model to help us make sense of this? That makes sense. Okay. Well, how do we get there? So, and this also I want you to, this to be a model for how you think about your final projects too. And you start small and you build up like, you know, it's kind of like you're building up the onion in layers. And so the first question we could ask, you know, moving toward a hypothesis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you're really kind of looking for qualitative ideas. So it like whether an oscillation is this tall or this tall, that's not like that would require a very highly calibrated model where you'd have to know sort of everything that was going on here. But what this model could sort of tell you is like, if we look at this time series data without a model, there are these we call latent variables. And so it's kind of like they're non-observable variables that are nevertheless important that are driving the system. So there's stuff going on inside the members of OPEC that we can't see, you know, from you know sitting outside OPEC looking in. But we can hypothesize about what processes might be going on inside OPEC. And then with that, we could say, you know, if OPEC behaves this way, then we know that certain uh, things like if Russia gets involved or if China gets involved, it might trigger uh, processes inside OPEC that would be observable. And so um, if we start noticing that like, okay, we can build a model that includes how we think, how we hypothesize OPEC works, and it explains some of this past data, 
then that starts, we start seeing relationships that we didn't necessarily see before. Like it might have seemed totally random that uh that, that this second spike happened, and we don't really have an explanation for why that spike happened. But the system dynamics model can help us discriminate between, well, could, maybe this is just a natural oscillation, or maybe there's some thing that happened in the world that triggered a response by OPEC that now that we have a dynamical model of OPEC actually explains why their response might have been so sharp. And then that will tell us, like, when should we care about, like, you know, Russia dumping a little oil in or taking a little oil or, or when or or does the model sort of suggest that unless you're dumping a whole lot of oil, it's not going to really matter. So it gives us a an idea of how to look kind of under the hood of the oil engine, whereas otherwise we're stuck just watching it drive along and have no idea what the underlying process is. Does that help? Or is that believable? Okay. Any other questions about this motivation? And we'll see an example of that towards the end here. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so when you're building these models, start small. And the first thing we focus on, since price was our main response variable, then we can sort of say, in general, the most generalizable, how is price determined in a market? Not an oil market, just anywhere. Just standard microeconomic stuff. And so if we think about um, from microeconomics, we say, well, price is driven by gap between supply and demand. When supply is low, demand is high, um, then you end up getting an increase in price. And, um, and that increase in price may uh, drive, um, uh, so that increase in price may drive more to be supplied and may drive less to be demanded. And that will gradually move these things together until you settle down on where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded, and you have some equilibrium price. And so if I focus on this, I'm like, well, that's gaps between, effectively demand is like a target and supply is like an actual, and a gap between them, well, this feels like kind of like the toilet model. So really, um, this is uh, a balancing feedback loop. Really, that's what we're seeing here, probably with delay. So whenever I see a, a fundamental process being described by a response to a gap that effectively closes that gap, I should start maybe thinking about this feedback loop, this system's archetype. And so I can say, well, you know, I've got a demand for oil. That's kind of like my target water level a supply of oil, that's like the water level in the tank, uh, the gap between them drives an oil price. Well, the oil price and in investment, that's sort of like the vow that's in the bringing water into the tank or bringing, bringing the supply of oil up. So when there is a large gap, then the oil price will increase and that will end up increasing investment and in finding more oil. But it takes a while for that of uh, finding that to actually find the oil and excavate it and make it actually able to be supplied to the market. So there's some delay there, but eventually that will close the gap. So this is a simple loop that we might start with that sort of suggests that oil is just your average market, like any other market you describe in microeconomics. And, um, and so we start there, we might build a little model like that, and it might give us you know, oscillation with delay. We know that this system's archetype, if the delay is long enough, we build a stock and flow model um, that kind of captures all this, then it's common for us to get sort of uh, these oscillations here um, over time. And we might even note that this, uh, that if these are tuned just right, like if this delay is, like maybe it takes roughly five years to go for, um, you know, a, a new investment in oil to actually getting the oil into market. Well, maybe that might explain why there are these five-year cycles in some of these oscillations. And if I look at some of the oscillations in my historical graph, that looks like it could maybe match these like five-year oscillations here. So maybe this simple feedback loop um, helps to explain this part of the historical data, that this was just Rockefeller um, trying to control price um, by bringing supply in and maybe taking it out. Um, and, uh, and it just takes a while to adjust all that capacity. And that's why you get these like five-year oscillations. So maybe I've explained this part and that's great, but I'm, my goal is to explain more than just that part. And I can see here, 
that there's these long regions of stability. Well, if these oscillations are fundamental to just the time it takes to invest in getting more oil, then I should keep seeing the oscillations here. So that suggests that maybe this isn't really the whole story of what's going on here, certainly not what's going on here. And on top of that, there's more parts of this graph, like this, this doesn't look at all like what I'm expecting over here. The period is different. The magnitude is different. Um, it just it just looks like I'm, I'm missing a big part of the picture. And then it makes also sense that I know that OPEC is not just being driven by microeconomic pressures here, um, that they're, you know, they're actually using the price to do things. And so, um, so they, they kind of make sense that a different process should be going on here. So I probably need something like this, but I probably need to bolt onto it other things that account, that help to account for long regions of stability and um, the sort of OPEC response to sort of geopolitical events and things like that. So I start with a little thing and then I start building. So that's what we're kind of going to do here. So um, the way they did this in the real system is they said, okay, we can't just have microeconomics. I mean, that, can, that has to be a part of it, but we need other things. Now, you don't launch in to just deciding on all of your stocks at once. Start at the higher level and say, what are the, the basic uh, major portions of the model? And that's what, Mor uh, that's what yeah, Moorcroft calls sectors. And so they decided that there were five major sectors. And those sectors are kind of set by here. So some of them might only have one stock in them, but in general, you can imagine maybe multiple stocks. And it turns out like, um, you know, this market here and these independents will have maybe more than one stock in them, but, uh, but they kind of draw them as a stock and a flow in each one. But these are meant to be large scale sectors. And so we're going to have our, um, our market here, so price and demand. So that's kind of the, the, the basics of that feedback loop that we normally got there. And that's kind of going to be folded in with what the independents are doing. So the independents, um, you know, a free market um, like this is one where no supplier can control the price. They just have to take it at face value. That's the price. And it moves up and down and the supplier can't even do it. And so that's kind of what's going on here. The oil price goes up, the independence production goes down. And this together, these two boxes here, are really basically the feedback loop that we just saw. But then we tack onto the side of that um, all of these interesting features that are going on inside OPEC that we're going to talk about here. OPEC setting quotas, um, a big swing producer that um, has a bunch of control over oil, and the rest of OPEC, the opportunists who are told by the spring swing producer not to produce more than a certain amount, but will be tempted to produce a little bit more. So we're going to see the swing producer not only responding to world events, but the swing producer generally trying to control the other opportunists in OPEC. And so some of the interesting volatility, volatility we get is actually just the internal dynamics of, the, of OPEC trying to control itself as opposed to control the rest of the world. Because there's going to be these opportunists who want more money than uh, they've been allowed by the agreements. So that's what we're going to have to set up, this kind of more complex model here. So let's drill down and think about um, some of these uh, stock or some of these sectors. And so, um, like I said, these two here are basically your traditional microeconomics uh, stuff here. So um, it's basically going to, if we if we drill down into these boxes, we'll end up seeing effectively gaps between supply and demand that will cause oil price to go up and down. Those will happen here. And then we'll see an increase in investment with delay that will happen up here. And then that will end up dumping more oil into the market, which will change the price. And this here will end up being captured by this loop here. So, um, but then OPEC, that will be the thing that's fundamentally different. And that's got explicit control over the market and um, pressures, internal pressures. So that's what we'll kind of look at. So let's take a look at OPEC because that's the thing that's most different. So how does OPEC work? Um, so OPEC looks at the commercial market and then says that they want to set a certain price. And so they know the commercial market's already dumping a certain amount of oil out there. And if the market equilibrium is a price that's too low for them, then they might decide to pull oil out of the market. If it's too high for them, they might decide to dump oil onto the market uh, until they get this desired price. So there is a process inside OPEC where, where they end up deciding what their desired price is. And then from there, they tell all their members how much oil 
they need to dump in order to control that price. So um, the, all their members have to agree that together OPEC puts this amount of oil onto the market. And, um, and then that's going to bring profits back to the individual members of OPEC, while also potentially um, putting a cost on the rest of the world uh, because of how they're controlling this price. So by establishing quotas and price controls, they control their own revenues. So if you have enough oil that you can effectively pull, create a sudden shortage of oil, you have the ability to raise the price because the rest of your competitors can't respond quickly enough. And while the price is high enough, then um, all of your members will end up benefiting not much more from every gallon of oil that they're selling. So it's kind of how OPEC uh, sets that. The way they make it all work is they've got a swing producer that has a whole bunch of oil that they can put on the market or take off at very little internal cost. So the swing producer um, has doesn't have to wait that five years to find new oil. They can just sort of tomorrow dump a bunch of oil on the market and, um, and then tomorrow take it all back. And so their fast ability to put oil onto the market and their huge supply of oil allows them to swing the market. So they are um, have so much inertia that the it's like the center of math is on them. And in OPEC, that's largely Saudi Arabia is the swing producer. So all of OPEC's got a lot of oil, but Saudi Arabia has got a huge amount of oil and it's readily available. So uh, that's how they use it. So they provide fast acting feedback and that allows them to respond almost immediately to changes in price. But the rest of the opportunists, the rest of the members of OPEC also have a lot of oil. They are told that even though the swing producer has to produce so much oil, they still have to produce a certain amount, but not any more than that. Because if they want to hold the price high, if the opportunists produce too much oil, it will eventually move the price lower. So this creates a temptation to defect, like a prisoner's dilemma a little bit here. So the idea being um, that, um, and I see some comments in the chat, I'll take a look at here in a second, but the idea here being that let's say everyone agrees that we're going to not put that much oil on the market just so to hold the price way up high. Well, now if you're a little opportunist, um, you could say, well, you know what? It's not gonna hurt if I just put a little more oil on the market because that's not gonna move the price down very much. And now I was making so many million dollars per whatever uh, increment. Now I can make a little bit more and who's gonna notice? And so that's, there's always that temptation that the opportunist can produce a little bit more. The swing producers uh, agree that they are, they're not gonna produce uh, more than that. And they're counting on these guys not to produce more than that um, because the swing producer also you know, could make more money if they were produced more. But again, that would bring the price down in the long run. So there's this temptation for the um, the opportunist to overproduce, and the um, and the swing producer will try to detect that more oil is going onto the market, and if it is, the swing producer and as we'll see in the model can respond by suddenly flooding the market with oil, not to bring the price down to hurt any of the other producers in the rest of the world. They don't really care much about them, but it's to hurt their own. Because so if you are a member of OPEC and you start overproducing, then um, the swing producer, there's always the threat that the Saudi Arabia is going to flood the market with oil to the point where you're not going to make any money whatsoever on your oil because the swing producer has produced so much cheap oil that it's basically reduced the value of your oil to nothing. So there's always the risk that the swing producer will do that. So uh, they're going to be tempted um, to start to go a little over quota, but once they go well over quota, there's that risk that comes back that can really hurt them. So, uh, so that's kind of what we need to have. It's in our model. So <clears throat> that's kind of the idea here is that we want to build a model that has all of those dynamics in it. That's got the quota setting, the swing producer monitoring everything, dumping a whole bunch of oil on the market, pulling it back, the opportunist being tempted to defect, uh, but also maybe, you know, um, uh, to doing what they're told. And then meanwhile, these poor independents over here just doing whatever the price of the market says they're doing, which might uh, require them to invest. But whenever they make an investment in, in expanded oil capacity, it's going to take them a while to get that oil. And meanwhile, other stuff will be happening here. So 
that's what they decided to build. And we're going to drill down into these sectors and see what, how some of them look. But that's the motivation behind all this. We could have made other choices, but they were interested in um, understanding uh, hypothetical uh, futures that were driven primarily by OPEC. And that's why they decided on this model. So any questions? I mean, I know the details might seem murky, and that's what we're going to drill down into some of these sectors and look at them in more detail. But um, the general idea of, of this idea of kind of the OPEC-centric model of the oil market. Uh, and there's just some comments online about, uh, yeah, OPEC is, um, you know, it's uh, that you know what OPEC does would be illegal in the United States because of our laws on um, on collusion between companies. But of course, nothing's illegal on the world stage, uh, so you know they're free to do it. Okay. All right. So um, so let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail, um, and just to see how we build some of these things up, see how complicated they have to be. So, um, so if we zoom in a little bit on the independence sector, then we have this stock independence capacity. That's how much oil they could produce. And there's a flow which has to do with the change in their capacity. So um, how much investment they have on expanding this capacity. And so we have to think about what factors could possibly drive the independence here. And some of these will be exogenous factors that we have to estimate from data or surveys or whatever. So for example, there's this thing that they have here called CapEx investment optimism. This is a psychological parameter that um, we would imagine putting a slider on. And we would say, like, um, this is basically how jittery in a kind of a positive way are our independence going to be. And so if things look, uh, you know, if price is a little higher, how responsive are they to price to, to, to price so that they, you know, triggers them to, um, to start uh, producing more. So if they are really optimistic, then that means that a slight increase in price means that it's probably going to stay there for a long amount of time. The small increases in price for short amount of times will cause for higher investments. Kind of similarly, um, we know that there's a current market oil price, but we know that inside each one of these independents, they've got their own little statistical models where they're predicting what the future oil price is based on the current oil price. And that's what, you know, because it takes so long to invest. So it's, I think this is kind of interesting because we are modeling how they're modeling. So it's kind of meta here and that we know that the, um, that the independents are not going to respond directly to oil price. They are going to have some sort of um, model of what they think will happen. And we have to sort of guess um, you know, what they think is going to happen based on this oil price here and put that in there. And that could be like a lookup table sort of idea that based on the current oil price, what do they think the oil price will be, say, next year or in the next five years? You know, how much it costs to actually develop, you know, for every unit of oil. And, um, and then there's things like taxes, you know, and so um, how much they're taxed for every unit of production is going to affect their feeling about on how much if they want to increase that. And so um, that's going to create a threshold, sort of a hurdle rate where based on how much uh, return on investment that all of these things come together to predict, if it's under this hurdle, then maybe they don't uh, develop more. If it's over this hurdle, that's when they start developing. So these are all the factors that you might imagine would go into this. And if you think about it, this is really almost just like a causal loop diagram because um, this is just a basic stock and flow stock with the flow. And I just need to say, well, what am I going to set the flow to? Well, I just have all these things that I think might correspond to this flow. And so once I account for them, the math here is not going to be too complex. Um, it's just coming up with all of these things. That's really sort of takes the thinking. And so um, the way that looks in more detail is this thing here. So here we've got, um, you know, if you start, you know, you say, well, this is basically what we want to capture. Well, when you actually start, um, you know, when the rubber meets the road, things get a little more detailed, but you shouldn't get uh, too, um, uh, like, if you started with this, this looks far more complicated, but this is really the same thing that's going on here. 
like I see a lot of stocks. Like I see like these these multiple stocks here. Um, well, this stock here, notice has the same name as this stock here. So it's just not really that well shown in the stock and flow diagram, but this is basically like a uh, ghost variable for this thing here. So they basically didn't want to draw um, a bunch of lines going backwards. So they created a copy of this over here. So it's not actually three stocks. It's, it's a little bit simpler than that. This is just, um, you know, like I said, a ghost variable or a shadow variable, a ghost primitive or a shadow variable for this thing here. And then you see, well, um, what's going on with these two stocks together? Well, um, this is like a stage structured model. Um, so you can almost think of it as a smoothing delay where um, where you've got this, this is like the capacity in construction that will eventually become independence capacity. In other words, it's kind of like an SIR model or maybe an IR model. Like these are the things that are infected. We know they're eventually going to become recovered, but we know that we have to account for the time it takes in construction. So when we start investing, we don't immediately grow our capacity. It takes a little bit of a delay. And so that's all that's being modeled here is that that little bit of extra delay. So they just added a little bit of stage structuring there. Not that big of a deal. And then all of this, and this is just a coordinating network that represents the math that brings together all of this stuff that we think is important into an investment decision in this flow here. So um, it's so it looks a lot worse than it is because we're just trying to represent all of these exogenous variables going into some formulas here. But it's really not not that bad. And then there's this um, um, under this um, uh, extra stock that they tacked on here, but it's effectively just a constant because notice there's no flows. Sometimes we'll put another stock on there um, and its initial condition basically makes it act kind of like a variable. And that just kind of um, implies to the, the person looking at it that it is, it, it's not an exogenous variable, but it's almost like a stock that we just have left over on its side. And so their undeveloped reserves are just over there and we could uh, do more with them, um, but it's it's um, it was almost like a graphical choice to make them into a stock as opposed to into some exogenous variable like hurdle rate because we want to depict to the reader that the, this is a is actually like a physical quantity that's out there sitting there and the amount of them is going to affect um, the uh, expressions here. Um, but they may as well be a variable, but they've just drawn them in a stock. So this looks a lot more complicated than it is. It really is basically just two stocks structured like an IR model um, with a, kind of a coordinating uh, network to decide how to grow this first stock. And this first stock, it basically naturally is going to grow the second stock. And then the second stock is going to have some depletion, kind of like um, just a natural sort of death rate or whatever, just just due to you know capacity loss. Like eventually, uh, oil wells dry up. So there's not a lot going on here, even though it looks like it is. So are there any questions about this model? Like how we basically you know we, we sort of build the layers up. You know we knew we needed something like this, and we actually needed to start drawing the stocks and flows. We realized we needed a little bit more, but um, but if you started here, it looks a lot worse. Really, this is just an attempt to do this which um, is just effectively like a simple feedback loop. Okay. Right. And then so a lot of these exogenous variables we pick out from experts. It's kind of the, the hint here. So we don't have those. Um, so when a lot of them are looked up, uh, is provided as lookup tables. Here's a lookup table right here. has a little squiggle in it. Um, one of these is a slider. So we have no idea what the CapEx optimism is going to be, but we're going to be able to slide it from one point to another to see how sensitive the model is for it. Okay. All right. So um, that uh, was a kind of our, our independence here. Um, if I want to add in the whole market here, then I can create a stock for demand and a stock for price. So price changes over time, so it needs to be a stock. The demand changes over time, so it needs to be a stock. So they have flows, and they're just naturally written as change in price, change in demand. When in doubt, um, just create your stocks first, and then your flows just add change in, and that's your flow. And so we're saying here that um, the 
demand for oil might change just naturally uh, with, for example, the effect of the global economy environment. This is some exogenous variable which affects how demand for oil grows or shrinks over time. So we can just put that in there and say whether this is uh, you know, shrinking or growing. Um, but then we also have the um, market oil price here. So as the oil price goes into the change for demand, we might imagine that um, with high prices, it's going to reduce demand. And with low prices, it's going to maybe increase demand. And that's why that price has to go in. Once we have our demand, that demand goes into here. We compare it to production. And if this is just our toilet model system. So if there is a big gap between demand and production, then the price is going to go up. If there is a little gap or there, it's flipped so that we're producing more than demanded, then it's going to go down. And so these two things interact and end up coming to equilibrium at the market price. So this is your basic microeconomics here. And so total production, that's going to come from our independence and then eventually also from our OPEC. So any questions here about you could this little module here? You could make this for anything. It doesn't have to be for oil. If you have anything in your final projects to where price might change over time, you could use this. So this is the market price for movie tickets. And that's the demand for movie tickets. And this is the change in demand. And you could simulate how you know streaming uh, networks um, change the dynamics of people going to the movies or something like that. And you could use this almost verbatim as it's sort of built here. All right, questions online? All right. Okay, so that those were um, kind of the like standard parts. And now we've got the OPEC specific stuff, which is really where the, the real meat of this is. This really makes, makes it different than your standard market. And so, like I mentioned, the, the Saudi Arabia, the swing producer, they're either in a, a normal operating mode or kind of a punishing mode, because they're not only trying to set the world's price, but they're trying to keep the opportunists in line. So. In the normal, uh, we call swing mode, um, we have the market oil price. So again, swing oil production, just a stock. And so change in production, the flow. So when in doubt, your flows are just change in your stocks. You know, nothing. And then you say, well, what causes the change in the stock? Well, the quota setting group is gonna pass in an intended price. And then the market oil price is going in here. And so, um, so it, those two things, if there's a difference between those, then that's going to affect whether the swing producer is going to produce more or less. So the swing producer has got a quota. And so um, that quota is what this thing kind of gets modulated around. So if the oil price is greater than the intended price, then the swing producer needs to produce less. If the oil price is, um, is less than the intended price, then uh, the swing producer needs to produce more. So basically, um, the sign of this um, ends up uh, modulating how much above and below maybe the quota is going on here. And that's what normally goes on, which helps the swing producer production go up and go down. So we've got the spring, the, uh, the production is compared to their quota. And so if they're under quota, they'll produce more. If they're over quota, they'll produce more. And then um, the prices also contribute to that. So whether they're over or above quota, and whether over or above price will change how much they're producing. So that's the simple kind of like the swing producer trying to control the world. So any questions about that? This is like under normal operation, this is what goes on. Okay, and then um, the swing producer will periodically switch into punitive mode. So there will be a part of this model which basically affects the flow formulas, whether the flow formulas are using the previous ones or these ones. And it will have to do whether the swing producer detects that the opportunists are over or, uh, or over their quotas, generally over their quotas. And so again, the market oil price um, goes in, but the swing producer basically has a punitive price. It's really, really low. So basically when the spring wing producer gets pissed off because the opportunists are overproducing, then they could say, fine, instead of doing $50 a barrel, like we agreed, how about two, $2 a barrel? And they just dump, you know, so they kind of agree that there's a punitive price that they're just gonna start dumping oil onto the market until the price gets that low. And eventually it will get so bad for the opportunists, the opportunists are going to start pulling their oil from the market in a, one attempt to try to raise the price, but also to fall in line 
with the swing producer. And then the swing producer will detect that and switch back. And, um, and then the price will raise again. So um, now in order to figure out if they need to, to go into this, they've got their estimated current market share and a maximum threshold for market share. So basically the um, the, this is sort of goes into them detecting whether, you know, like they know that they should be producing a certain share of the market. And if that share falls below a certain threshold, then that means that an opportunist is now producing too much oil. And they're kind of like, um, you know, that's messing up the swing producer. And that's what would trigger this punitive change here. So it doesn't really change much. It really just changes the target price, really. But what triggers the change in price has to do with um, the, the market share distribution across all of the OPEC members. All right, so any basic questions? I know I'm leaving out some of the formulas here. Moorcroft has the formulas, I think, at the back of this chapter. Uh, but I just want to give you kind of a high level because the, the actual formula aren't that matter that much. I'm just hoping you can see that, that, um, that, that it's a simple idea where we kind of come up with what variables matter. And then we can struggle with how to create a formula to implement that. But that's kind of a, a different, that's like a quantitative problem and not a qualitative problem. As long as we qualitatively have all the variables here, we have enough to get this model going. So hopefully we can see that these are the variables we would need to sort of implement this punitive mode. Okay. So setting an allocation, uh, quota setting, uh, again, quota, we make a stock because it changes over time. And you know, when in doubt, the flow is change in the stock, change in agreed quota. And so we've got um, some sort of quota bias that has to do with a quota that kind of like where they want to start their quota. Uh, uh, and then uh, based on how much demand is coming from the globe, how much is being produced by the independents, they estimate how much oil needs to be produced by OPEC. Um, and, um, and that's how they end up deciding on the quota. Um, so um, this allows for kind of slow dynamics here in this bias here term. Uh, and then um, for negotiation here, so um, this has to do with the, uh, where this is deciding who in the swing producer or the opportunist is going to be producing that quota. And so uh, this is important because we, because uh, the agreed upon ratio here is what's going to trigger that punitive mode. And so if you don't give the opportunists enough oil to produce, if you don't agree that they're allowed to produce that, they will be more likely to, um, to start uh, uh, cheating and that might trigger this punishment more often. So, um, so, this, uh, so playing with this part, which is actually you know, deciding the balance of this quota across OPEC, can change how rapidly you get into that punitive mode. And then the last thing we have to deal with is the cheating. And so down here, we've got the opportunist capacity, how much oil they can produce, their change in capacity. Um, and then <clears throat> from their capacity, this is how much they could produce. This is how much they actually do produce up here is their opportunist production here. And they've got their negotiated uh, quota. And so if uh, they need to produce more, that might take them a while to grow their capacity or they might immediately be able to produ produce it. What I wanna draw attention to is this surplus utilization. I think they might highlight this. Yeah, so there is this, this lookup table that we use where it's got a price gap here. Um, and this price gap, it goes from negative five to zero. And so this is a, um, they, they, they say it's a surrogate for the apparent cohesion of the cartel. So the idea is if it's at zero, then, um, then so imagine you set a price. And, um, and so when you are at the price that everyone's agreed on, that's when they're most tempted to cheat. And that's what is, um, is represented by this surplus utilization here. So they're saying when you're at the price, everyone's got the greatest chance to cheat. But if you are say $5 a barrel below the price, that means that there's so much cheating going on, it's lowered the price in the world market, $5 less than everyone's agreed on. And we're pretty sure that the swing producer is gonna notice and gonna punish us by flipping into punitive mode. So this represents the kind of uh, betting 
of the opportunists that they can um, produce a little bit more, but eventually once they produce so much that they kind of hold on. And so, um, so this is an example of using kind of a lookup table. Like we really don't know the psychology of the opportunists, but we generally have a feeling that this is probably shaped something like that. And so if we're just looking for qualitative results, then we can put in this sort of function here, which might again be impossible to fit from data, but it still captures the idea that they'll be the most cheating when you're at the agreed upon price and the least cheating when you're below it, because you know you're, you're tempting the swing producer to swing into action and produce. So this lookup table is going to be incorporated um, into the opportunist choice for their production. So questions about that, how you can create this little lookup table. This is kind of like in the in the EasyJet example, we had an example of how likely people were to refer friends to EasyJet based on how much cheaper EasyJet was relative to the rest of the market. The same sort of idea here is that when the price is close to the target, then you're, uh, you're eager to cheat. When the price is far from the target, you don't dare cheat. Okay. So then we say, you know, uh, did we do everything in this model? And when they, in Shell's case, um, at the end of building this model, USSR crumbled and, um, and Russia became a thing. And Russia had a bunch of oil that previously only was distributed among USSR. And now it was available to the world market. But nobody really knew whether they could safely use this oil. It was kind of untested. So um, they decided, well, we should probably build um, that in. So we have these undeveloped reserves. Well, maybe we can kind of expand that idea and say that, well, this stock of undeveloped uh, reserve, maybe it'll grow over time based on access to Russian reserves. And again, this is like, an eight, you know, this is just a sort of an age structured model, like an SIR model. Um, suddenly risky Russian reserves become available and there's no even inflow here. It's just saying that there's a certain amount of uh, you know, oil that is now available in the market, uh, but nobody trusts it. So there, this has got this time constant, time to build trust in Russia. So you can imagine the formula here, like it's just gonna be risky Russian deserves divided by the time constant. So um, that's going to allow these risky Russian reserves to become a stock of secure Russian reserves. And then at this point, you're willing um, to use it, uh, but you aren't, uh, you don't necessarily need it yet. And so, um, or you need to go through contracting. So before it actually becomes part of the independence undeveloped reserves, then um, it has to go through this adoption process where you've got another time constant, time to agree to rights. And so this is like the contracting period, the actual time it takes to buy this oil and get it um, into your undeveloped reserves. And then they also added um, this thing that we didn't have before, this development here, where um, you've got, uh, this is, this. The remember that in Stella, the white uh, line is the kind of positive direction. So you know it looks like this is going back. This is actually going forward and saying that there's, again, a time constant. Some of these undeveloped reserves, if you don't use them, you lose them. So just uh, they'll actually sort of decay over time. So this is modeling the adoption, the, the time, the, the very long delay of adding oil, um, and then the, um, the loss of oil just due to natural decay of those resources. So we can add those in, and it just gets added in in that little that box before that I said was, you know, previously we could have just used as a variable instead of uses a stock. Well, making it a stock. Um, which is not only sort of more kind of physically accurate, but it also allows for expanding the model a little bit more easily because then we just drag in these flows and then suddenly, you know, it's pretty much otherwise exactly the same model. So if I go back here, none of the rest of this changes. We just bolted on a Russia section um, to these undissolved reserves. And then that will have downstream effects on this uh, these dynamics here. So that's how we add Russia in. And that kind of completes the post-USSR break, USSR breakdown model. Very different from the oil model we have today, but its lease was much better for oil market then. So if I put all those things together as a causal loop diagram, it looks like this ugly thing. 
So you've got um, a bunch of feedback loops for OPEC. You've got these other feedback loops here for the general market, um, opportunists, Russia, um, all that's kind of together here. Um, but in the stock and flow model would be even worse. And if you look at supplementary documents I posted on Canvas, I forgot, I think Moorcroft didn't even post all of the details there, but I thought I went and found his model that they end up building that was based on this. And so the supplementary documents there, you can find with the actual stock and flow model and all these formulas. And it's pretty complex, but I hope you can see that although it's complex, it wouldn't take that long to sort of, as it's, it's, long as you analyze it bit by bit by bit, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It's the same sort of idea um, is that, you know, you have to start small and then kind of build up from there. And so what do you get? How do you get that model? So this goes back to that first question of, um, you know, what can we use that model for? Well, you can do scenario testing. And so um, I thought this was a great example that Borcroft had here where um, the, You've got a so this is market oil price and demand minus production. So uh, market oil price is line one, so it's kind of rising a little bit, and then it starts oscillating. And if I look at demand minus production, that's this line up here. It's pretty constant, so there's like a constant uh, difference between demand and production, and then it oscillates. And um, and so those two things are kind of related here. So um, we can this happens without changing any sliders or whatever. So this is just a natural effect of the model. And we kind of get a hint that there's something going on here because it's like the market oil price is rising and then suddenly that like that's changing over time, but everything else looks about the same. So the idea here is that we can get these sudden changes in the qualitative behavior of the system that are explained by internal dynamics of the system. And what we actually see here is that there's cycles of punitive actions that are triggered by changes in price inside the model. And so, um, so this is an example where it's not like there was a shock to the system, which uh, led to these oscillations. It was like everything was internal to the system. So this tells us that, wow, this punitive process that goes on inside OPEC it can lead to huge cycles. So it's like, regardless of what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, just OPEC managing its own business um, it could create major you know, downstream effects on everyone else's oil, just because OPEC's try to keep the opportunists in line. So that's something you can kind of learn from this model is that you might look for, uh, you know, like these are huge oscillations. I'm sure that has something to do with the world market. Turns out this is all, this can be explained, this model suggests, just by the internal dynamics of OPEC trying to control themselves. And so when we compare this model, which comes out of a dynamical systems model, it's like comes out of Insight Maker or VinSim. And then we look over at, I thought I had another highlight here, we look over at our time series, then we start seeing that, you know, here's like a relatively constant portion, here's a relatively constant portion, sudden uh, trigger to oscillations, sudden trigger to oscillations, and then it gives us kind of a new lens on which to look at this here. So we can look at what's going on in this portion when OPEC gets involved, purely as OPEC trying to, you know, let the world know that it has control of oil, or we can look at these as transient dynamics of OPEC getting control of itself, you know, trying to sort of say, well, all right, in order to get the opportunists in line, I have to show them that um, that we need to, um, that maybe I need to take a bunch of oil off the market, then I need to respond, maybe there's an over response, and so on and so forth. And then maybe now OPEC functioning for a while until something else happens, maybe internal to OPEC, maybe external. But the fact that we can get these type of dynamics out of a relatively simple model now gives us a totally new perspective to look at what here looked like, you know, we couldn't make any sense of it. So that's kind of the hope that we can, how we can use these models. So there's a whole lot more about this. Um, I, this chapter is dense. Moorcraft does a lot of, um, of interesting investigations. I recommend skimming through it to give you ideas of things you could do with your final project. He'll do things like change sliders around. He'll introduce some other stuff. Asia gets involved. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that he does with this model that hopefully maybe gives you some ideas of things you could do with your final project. I just wanna use this kind of simple example to give you an idea 
of of how you can build um you know these these what look to be really crazy models which really aren't that complex when you do you drill down into them but they can have really rich behavior so any questions about this yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, right, right. So, I mean, so some of this was was just sort of a, um, you know, trying to map some patterns here or patterns here to say that we can start asking those questions. And so, so I guess my kind of the point here is that maybe not the rise is illustrative of what I was talking about, but let's say that OPEC decides that they would like the world to be paying $70 a barrel. And um, when the world was paying twenty dollars a barrel, and they bring it up to seventy dollars a barrel, and um, and let's say, uh, and then so, and at some point, the opportunists say, you know what, for seventy dollars a barrel, maybe I can cheat a little bit and make a little bit more money. And so this oscillation going down here might be OPEC saying, wait, I'm going to punish all you opportunists. And then there's a renegotiation process where the opportunists say. There's no way you can like for seventy dollars a barrel. Swing producers making way too much money, um, and then they might renegotiate, and then decide that oh, actually maybe it's okay for the world to be paying twenty five bucks a barrel, um, and so then it stabilizes here. So it may be that this single downswing is watching that punitive action, um, as opposed to thinking of like this this up. So this might be OPEC triggers their control, and this is them adjusting. To a new set point. So this is their attempted set point, failure, um, renegotiation, new set point. But um, and I'm not saying that's actually what happens here, but that explanation was an explanation we did not have before we went through this process and saw that you can get um, like down here a rise in price and then a sudden fall in price followed by oscillations. Well, that's really what we have here. We have it's a more rapid, but a rise in price, a sudden fall in price, and then oscillations. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's not that far back. You would say this one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this, I think, um, and, and so they don't have what I would normally assume is um, a, a feed forward length going from here to the flow. So normally I would say this is like a time constant. I don't know if that's been left out by accident. Um, there's also, I think, in um, some of you may have noticed it, but an insight maker, and I think in Stella, they always give you this, this forward link to these flows for free. Um, even though I always tell you to draw them. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think this is meant to be sort of a time constant to sort of say that um, you've got a bunch of, you can, the units for this stock are fields. And so there's this many oil fields that are out there. But if you don't use those oil fields, then there's just some lifetime of them where they get spun down. And so this is how long on average a field stays uh, usable. And so this is just a number that, you would, you know, ask an oil expert and they'd say, yeah, fields aren't really good for more than 10 years. And then you put a 10 right there. No, no, that's, that's good. Any other questions? And again, I hope you start seeing these like stock and flow type motifs. Again, this is again, really much like an SIR model, like these age structured uh, things. Like whenever you're thinking like, I have this population, but you know, I know that I like, you know, I, I get juveniles and juveniles really don't start contributing to the workforce until say an average of 15 years or something like that. And, um, and then once they're there, they're only there for a certain amount of time. And then they, they start moving to like, so when, when you start thinking like a, of a population, you realize it's not monolithic. 
then it's the same idea here. Like if I think of my reserves, reserves, oil reserves aren't monolithic either. So there's some that I can kind of immediately get, some that I'm about to purchase, and some that I really need to mature. And so as they come online here, it's going to take a while for them to get here. So in your head, you just think reserves, but then when you get actually down to building the model, then it comes down to sort of saying, well, actually, this is a stage structured model, um, just like I would do um, in thinking about you know, uh, moving through uh, age development in a population, or even like an SIR model where effectively the I's um, become R's and really the S's become I's eventually. It just happens to be modulated by the both of these. So you can almost think of an SIR model as like a special case of this where they took, they said, well, what if the S to I transition depends on both the number of S's and I's. And then so we'll, we'll end up making that adjustment. But overall, the dynamics are really similar. So, so any other questions or comments about this kind of case study or this example? All right. Great. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of extra time uh, today. So if you want to stick around and work with your teams, remember that on Tuesday, we're going to have this final project model check-in exercise where you just build a minimal tiny bit of your model and just show that it does the right thing. Like doesn't produce negative numbers if it's not supposed to produce negative numbers and so on. So by the end of the class, you can demonstrate that your group has got a kernel of something you can build on to for the rest of the project. And then I'll leave you alone until the end of the semester. Um, so if you want to work on that today, that's great. Um, otherwise, um, you know, uh, weekend. So there's the muddiest points Sunday night. Uh, E5 is due Sunday night. Um, remember, there's a drop policy on the assignments. I think it's like drop one or something like that. So double check on Canvas. I don't want to misquote myself. Um, and there's some bonus in E5, and there's perusal and, um, and all the reading suite of assignments for chapter 9 and 10, which we do before Thursday's lecture and next Tuesday lectures. And when you start reading for chapter 9, make sure to skip some of these uh, sections up here. So skip the medical workforce and the appendix one, a pretty long chapter, so you can uh, stop before those. So any questions? All right, so in that case, um, I'll uh, put up an attendance exercise here, and then it's up to you on how you'd like to use the last 10 minutes. So the uh, question I have is who or what country serves as the swing producer in OPEC? So I mentioned there's one country in particular that has very fast access to oil. It's really the one that swings prices as it wishes. And what is that country that is the inertia that sort of helps the, the, the rest of the world's oil price is kind of pinned on, or at least was at these times. And that's all I've got for you. So however you'd like to use the rest of the time. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, stop the recording.